hello everybody and good afternoon. Uh, I'm John Meadley here from Stroud in England. I I'm sorry that you're not seeing uh, Professor Mark Eisler, uh, who is going to chair this, but sadly he's unable to be with us um, today. So I'm chairing the session and perhaps there's some poetic justice in this since I organized uh, the session and brought these good people together. So why the focus on goats? Um, well, it reflects for me, I suppose, five, five decades spent uh, working in rural Africa uh, and Asia. And uh, I'll tell you a little story, and if I read a little bit, excuse me, but back in 1973, I found myself on a Sunday afternoon waiting for the ferry to cross the Gambia River in Banjul. And, and being a hot day, I bought some sucking oranges. I don't know whether you know what those are, but they're oranges which are really juicy but they're also quite fibrous, so you can't, you can't eat them afterwards, and they have to be disposed of. Now, I'm a war baby and the son of a cleric, and there were two thoughts on my mind as I contemplated this action. The first is, after the war, the concept of waste barely existed, and, and as there were no public litter bins in those days, uh, we were all exhorted to take our litter home. The second was that post-war post -war Sundays were very different to what they are today. All the shops were closed, nearly everybody went to church, and, and I wasn't allowed to roller skate. Um, so here am I in my early 30s uh, with no litter bins around and on a Sunday about to drop some orange carcasses onto the ground, hoping that neither my dad nor the Almighty can see me. <laughs> And to my amazement, as I dropped them, two goats emerged and gobbled them up. Goats, the hidden transformers. My guilt was over. The second time was when Farm Africa was formed in 1985, of which I think I've been a member since the very beginning. And they focused on goats in addressing the famine in Ethiopia in 1986. And the third was during 2001, <laughs> The six, when I was working in rural Sierra Leone and Liberia, both suffering armed conflicts, and I saw the vital role the goats can play in transforming the lives of traumatized people, providing milk and meat and skins and offspring to share with others. So there's a bit more about that in the session tomorrow afternoon on the healing role of farming, um, if, if you're interested. But it was at, at that time that I purchased um, this book, some of you may know, called Improving Goat Production in the Humid Tropics, written by Dr. Christy Peacock, the first chief executive of Farm Africa, uh, and which we used in, in, in Sierra Leone. Well, that leads me on to today's session, which has three very different takes on the vital role of goats, from Farm Africa in Ethiopia, from Rothamsted on work underway on controlling internal parasites and their socioeconomic benefits, and from Street Goat, just down the road from me in Bristol, on converting brambles into milk. Um, so we'll go through the three sessions one by one, uh, one after the other, uh, questions at the end, and then there's the opportunity for to go into a Zoom um, session at the end. So first, we have Mulugeta Woku in Ethiopia. He's Farm Africa's head of programs. He's over 20 years experience of managing programs for organizations, including Oxfam, Christian Aid, Save the Children, and he led the development of the National Framework for Climate Services for Ethiopia. And he's currently pursuing a PhD in natural resource management at Jimmy University. So Mulugeta, over to you. Mulu get to I I just wanted to let you know you're muted right now. I can uh, unmute you as well. You're good to go. Okay. Mulu get to you you're good to go. If you want to share your screen, I can get your presentation up. Uh, okay, so can 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 you can you can you see can you see the, uh, the my presentation? No, not yet. No, you still have to share your screen. Uh, okay, that's it. Okay. 
what about now yep you're good to go great thank you very much uh, uh for giving pharma africa the chance to to share our experiences in uh, oxford real farming conference uh, and I don't want to introduce myself and I'll directly take you into my presentation. Uh, I would like to uh, talk briefly about Pharma Africa, uh, one of uh, the international non-government organizations uh, working in agriculture environment and business. And the last pillar of intervention is a kind of cross-cutting type of intervention which cuts across agriculture and environment. Uh, and Farm Africa works in Africa, as the name uh, indicates, uh, and more specifically in Ethiopia, Uganda, Kenya, and in Tanzania. And very recently, we have an intervention in the Democratic Republic of Congo. And I would like to share, take you into uh, the operational context where Farm Africa is uh, currently implementing one of the development projects, which I'll be sharing later. Uh, and it's in South Omo, around uh, closer to Lake Turkana in, in uh, northern Kenya, in the southern Ethiopia, you know, where Hammer and Banazama is the South Omo area, and also Karamoja in northern Uganda. And uh, these are the geographical areas which are known to be homes of thousands of pastoralists who uh, move from place to place in search of war, pasture, and water. And uh, these are uh, fragile geographical areas uh, characterized by drought, degraded rangelands, and specifically very recently, uh, and also high rate of animal disease prevalence, and which all, all combined uh, compromising uh, production and productivity of livestock, and also worsening existing poverty and malnutrition. Uh, we have done recently a baseline study in 2018 when we started the project, uh, and we have found out that 68% of women in Karamoja in Uganda and 36% uh, of women in South Omo uh, were found to live under the poverty line. And we have also understood that women have very low uh, socioeconomic status as indicated by the score, which is a composite score uh, of women economic empowerment in agricultural survey. And there is also a high rate of illiteracy, where you can see 88% of Karamoja population are illiterate and nearly 80% in South Omo. Uh, all combined uh, have led these communities inhabiting these geographical uh, areas uh, to experience high uh, level of malnutrition. Uh, in these geographical areas, uh, goat rearing is a very predominant livelihood strategy uh, and they make up the greatest proportion of livestock. For example, in Ethiopia, in South Omo part, the goats represent 55% of the total livestock population, uh, except uh, in less poultry. Yet, uh, because of uh, multiple complex challenges associated with climate change, rainy land degradation and poor services, and also just the genetic makeup, uh, the productivity is very low. And more importantly, in the Ethiopian part, uh, goat milk production and consumption is very limited. And women assume actually the greatest role in, in goat production in both geographical locations. So given all those uh, contexts, actually, I have only highlighted some of the challenges in these two geographical areas. Uh, the, there is a follow-up question that what Farm Africa is doing in there in response to those challenges. And we launched an intervention called Lives, Livestock for Livelihoods uh, in line with the environmental and livelihood uh, challenges of both geographical locations. And this uh, intervention is supported by the UK aid uh, from the British people and from the Jersey overseas aid. Uh, and I would like to take this opportunity to thank uh, the UK uh, aid the UK government and uh, the Jesse Overseas Aid for supporting this project. And Farm Africa identified goats as key livelihood transformers, uh, actually join save them hidden transformers. I might be slightly disagree because they are not hidden, they are now becoming very, very vivid and very uh, uh, clear uh, what you call uh, stack uh, transformers in the face of climate change and rangeland degradation. 
And we work towards increasing income and uh, reduce malnutrition. And uh, we are planning to benefit 10,500 women and children, both South Omo and Karamoja combined. And we have a very key outcome areas in terms of goat production, in terms of breed improvement, health services, market linkages, dietary diversity, and knowledge management. Uh, in order to realize those outcome areas, we have uh, key intervention components. And the first one is women livestock groups. And Farm Africa supported uh, supports both Ugandan and Ethiopian pastoralist women to establish women livestock groups. And we have so far established about around 500 women livestock groups and uh, about 10,000, more about 10,000 beneficiaries in them. And these groups really add value to their goals. They run saving uh, and loan schemes, and uh, they learn uh, life skill train. Uh, they learn life skills, uh, and they have arrived by now. For example, taking the Ethiopian case, these groups have managed to save around two million Ethiopian bear, uh, and that is one of the pillar components to arrive at our outcomes. And the second one is a revolving goat scheme, as you can see from the picture. Uh, we have list of primary beneficiaries, list of women beneficiaries, and we have a pair. Uh, they, they will be paired with second level or uh, uh, in the queue, second level beneficiaries. They are also women. And two uh, female goats or the boys will be provided to the first uh, level of beneficiaries. And once say these go these doors, these female goats give offsprings, uh, their kids, so those kids, if they are two, automatically two, or if they are four, uh, all of the four kids will be transferred into the next level beneficiary. And once the first round bears transfer is completed, the primary women beneficiaries will own uh, their female goats so that they will they will start. You know, increasing their hearts accordingly. The cycle goes uh, to reach the final beneficiaries, and and we hope that this will be sustainable. Uh, and we have set you know several selection uh, criteria in collaboration with the uh, local community committee members and the local government, uh, taking into account like uh, pov level of poverty, uh, women or male head households, land holding, rangeland conditions disability and those factors and these are uh, the criteria that we have applied to prioritize and select uh, first level women beneficiaries in those geographical locations and uh, this is one of the testimonies uh, as one of the impact statements that we'll be, we would like to share uh, in Bernard Zama in South Omo, Ethiopia how Pita uh, felt very happy not only because she received uh, the female goats from Farm Africa, but because she was able to transfer the kids to her immediate neighbor, her friend, Sura, and how uh, that's really, uh, that how she is really hoping the goats will improve their, uh, their livelihoods in the future. And I think you'll, have, you'll find the text and read more uh, on that rather than reading on the text. And the third component is uh, improved breeds. Uh, because, as I said earlier, uh, local breed productivity, particularly in terms of meat production, uh, the carcass weight is very low. So Farm Africa introduced exotic breeds from South Africa. Uh, we call them the boar in, uh, boar in uh, South Omo. And I think uh, it's the uh, Hogenberg in Karamoja. So uh, through the backkeepers, uh, the what you call the crossbreeding service will be provided uh, to the livestock women groups who have the female goats so that the offsprings are expected to produce more carcass and more uh, uh, meat in addition to that recent studies have also confirmed that actually that they might be anecdotal but the offsprings have also proved to produce better milk compared to the local breeds as well so these backkeepers are said to provide services and in return they will receive payments so that the cycle continues and uh, one form of ensuring sustainability by setting this mechanism within the community. And the fourth component that we are uh, offering is animal health services uh, in kind of uh, a three-group approach. One is the women livestock groups, 
The second one is the community animal health workers, and the third one is the agro dealers, which we bring all these three groups together. So uh, the women groups will save money, uh, which they call goat funds, and they use that money to buy medicine from community animal health workers. Community animal health workers will be uh, have been provided with training, and uh, they will uh, uh, and they buy medicine from uh, agro dealers with a fair price. And Farm Africa facilitated the market linkage between the, the the agro dealers or the livestock medicine dealer uh, vendors and the community animal health workers. And the community animal health workers sell uh, medicines and associated services like spray uh, uh, and deworming and vaccination services to the women livestock groups. So both three groups will benefit out of out of the market and service linkages. And the fifth component is uh, nutrition, because malnutrition is widespread in both geographical locations. We have two components. One is awareness comp uh, creation uh, in terms of promoting uh, milk go from goats and also vegetable gardening. So uh, we, we are trying to tackle malnutrition through these uh, two mechanisms. And we have some testimonies from Karamoja, uh, whereby the Loki from Koditi in Karamoja is witnessing how uh, goat milk is benefiting uh, her family and how she's finding her baby to grow healthy and stronger. And the sixth component is business development. Uh, and actually, the, the women livestock groups, which I described earlier, are at the same time now becoming saving and loan groups, whereby they have weekly savings and uh, there is a loan scheme. In addition to what Farm Africa is supporting in terms of direct provision of goats, they will also invest some amount of their deposits through loan schemes to buy goats and also engage in a, as a as a, uh, a pity trading activities as well. Uh, and which uh, I earlier described as they managed to save about two million Ethiopian there. And finally, uh, I would like to. Uh, uh, share with you the key recommendations that came out of the lessons that we uh, learned so far from uh, from implementing this project. One is uh, we learned that the goat revolving scheme and women empowerment approach uh, have been found to be uh, in line with the values of the community in both geographical locations. And because the economic and uh, social impacts of this approach, we recommend this to be scaled up and out. And we have also found that the, uh, the community animal health workers should enjoy their current business in, engage, in providing animal health services, and that should be attractive. And in order to make that attractive and sustainable, the business and entrepreneurship capacity of these community animal health workers should be enhanced. And one of the most important elements in these two geographical locations, because of the dynamics of climate and environmental dynamics uh, that disfavors feed availability and wa water availability as well, uh, uh, what you call animal feed business development interventions should be uh, promoted in those areas so that the communities will, help, will be able to adapt to uh, continued pasture shortages uh, associated with this changing climate conditions and uh, rangeland degradation. And okay, there is there is another question which comes to in our mind: to what extent that will be adding extra number of goats, uh, uh, be, and that that should be limited by uh, the carrying capacity and the hills of rangelands, and also the feed production potentials of households. So uh, in order to understand that and set a threshold uh, of livestock density and carrying capacity, uh, some kind of research and assessment should be conducted to, uh, and should be evidence-based. And we need to work in that line as well. And as I, I talked earlier, that literacy level is extremely high. I mean, illiteracy level is very high uh, and there is what you call a needed, uh, an increasing demand for record keeping uh, and uh, interaction capacity of women can be enhanced through what you call literacy tra training. So we need to integrate women and adult literacy into upcoming interventions. 
and that is what I would like to share from Farm Africa side. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Uh, well, Mulugeta, thank you very much for a very inspiring um, uh, presentation on time. Um, and um, thanks for putting me right about the hidden transformers. I think then that's a, sort of a, a Western a Western perception. Um, really, we don't really appreciate over here yet uh, the full value um, of, of, of goats. Um, and um, it's hugely exciting. I'm hoping we can get you to come to Sierra Leone. And it reminds me of the circular economy in Alan McCarthy, this, this whole uh, thing that you've done. So thank you very much. Now we're going to move over now straight away to um, Lovemore, uh, Dr. Lovemore Guerrieri, postdoctoral smallholder livestock systems research scientist at Rothamsted, involved in agricultural systems socioeconomic al analysis. He researches the nexus of sustainable livestock systems rural development, food security, and livelihood resilience. And he's authored several articles and is a Netherlands Fellowship Program uh, Scholar and also a recipient of a PhD scholarship from uh, Coventry um, AWR. So Lovemore, over to you. Thank you. Um, thank you, June. Uh, and I'm, uh, I would like to say I'm happy to be uh, on this program. Uh, so I'll go straight uh, uh, over into my presentation. So I'll start uh, sharing my screen. Uh, okay, um, so I will start by saying that uh, 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 representing Rothamsted Research with a, a number of uh, collaborators that I will mention at the end of the presentation, uh, but mainly Queen's University, uh, yeah, and then also uh, we've got uh, partner universities in, in Africa that we're working with in Botswana and Malawi. We are carrying out a program where we are aiming to improve the livestock, uh, the livelihoods of small farmers through plant-based integrated livestock disease control and, and nutrition. So I'll go, uh, I'll go into uh, detail uh, in a moment. Um, so my first slide, I'm, I'm looking at um, the aspect of climate resilience strategies of which livestock uh, forms a key component of that, uh, in that uh, uh, climate resilience strategies uh, the way forward in terms of reducing livelihood vulnerability for the smallholder farmers, given the challenges that my uh, former speaker Mulugeta has already talked about. So here livestock, we see that it plays a key role in approximately uh, over 50, 52 million smallholder farmers in sub-Saharan Africa. And then it, livestock is also a risk a strategy that is used to buffer fragile agricultural systems. Uh, for example, what Mulugeta has talked about in terms of uh, droughts uh, and changing uh, climate scenario, as well as increasing emergence of, uh, of diseases. Um, so goats, for example, have been used as, a, as, 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 as sold uh, during drought uh, uh, to cater for uh, shortages. Then the advantage of ruminants, goats as such, is that they strive on marginal feed resources and thereby are able to contribute to household food or nutritional security, as well as income uh, diversity, uh, where crops have, uh, have had challenges with uh, climate change. Um, also, livestock has been also noted to make uh, non-economic and social cultural benefits. For example, they contribute to soil facility, fertility. They also contribute to employment in terms of uh, the agricultural sector, but also they've also been known to contribute to agricultural tra traction and as well as cultural roles where gods have been used in, in rituals in, 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 in some African communities. Um, then how, how are God linked to uh, how they contribute to that? So about 41% of the 1 billion uh, global God population is found in Africa. And our project areas, uh, which are Malawi and Botswana, we have about, about 8.9% million goats in Malawi and uh, 1.3 million goats in Botswana, which is a huge number of goats which contribute to livelihoods there. And then also goats, uh, studies in Botswana have said that goats contribute about 15% of the rural household income. So they really contribute uh, a large portion of that income. Uh, and they're holding 
uh, in Botswana has been estimated to be about 21 gods per household. So that also shows the um, importance of gods. If you look at the graph that is on your on your on your, on your right, you find that uh, gods are by far the largest uh, livestock that are kept by smallholder farmers. Uh, particularly maybe because of their uh, ease of uh, venturing into gold production. Uh, coming to Malawi, which is also our, our project area as well, they contribute to about 90% of the rural population in, 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 in Malawi. Uh, this has been studied by Kambata in 2020. So gods uh, have the ability also to survive in harsh environments, which characterize uh, most of the rural uh, landscape in which uh, smallholder farmers uh, try to make uh, a living in. Because of their thermal tolerance, they can tolerate high temperatures as well as a higher disease tolerance as opposed to other livestock species. And then uh, also to reiterate the point that goats are pro can, pro can be productive under a low plain nutrition in, wo in low water scarcity. That means that goats have, been ab have the ability to utilize browse species like trees that um, are available and convert this to usable protein as well as as an income. Um, and then also to continue on goats and rural livelihoods, um, our research, uh, if you look at the graphs on your right, our research has indicated that goats are normally kept by women uh, who, are, who have got um, uh, low literacy uh, therefore, they are able to uh, utilize these uh, resources to make a living. Um, goats have been noted that uh, to be highly fecund and also have got marketing, marketing ease that they are easier to sell because of most probably their low price and, and then uh, their low transport costs as well. Therefore, they are able to contribute to the financial capital uh, of, of our households. Also, in terms of gender, as uh, Mulugeta has already alluded in the previous uh, presentation, uh, they are mostly kept by women or uh, controlled by women. So this gives women the opportunity to be able to contribute to household income. Um, and then also, we also found in our studies uh, in Botswana and Mali that um, uh, owners of God um, also on other assets. So we also concluded that courts have got a, a propensity to, to own other assets. And then also because of their ease of uh, marketing and selling, uh, they're easily converted to other household and, um, uh, and uh, livelihood assets. And then also courts uh, also is, act as income and credit buffer. That means that um, uh, farmers are able to store their finances in terms of goods, and then they are easily able to convert that back to financial uh, financial income. Um, also, in terms of goat ownership and, and food security, we also did studies to try and understand the uh, impact of uh, goat ownership on food security. Um, we asked most of the farmers if they worried about uh, food uh, within the last week, and we also found that uh, farmers tend to worry less about food as, uh, as head size increases. This is most probably because they are able to sell goods quickly and then buy, uh, buy food uh, where there are uh, necessities to do that. So we find that on, the, on your left bottom uh, graph, find that as the goat holding increased, uh, the number of people who answered yes to worrying about food uh, actually reduced. Then you can also see on your uh, top right hand corner find that uh, we asked them uh, what was their major reason for keeping goats. We find that sales and savings combined uh, were by far the, the, the most important factor. But you also find that a lot of respondents talk about milk and meat as well as sales. On the, on the picture there you find uh, a, a woman that we talk about, a, a picture of in, in Botswana uh, milking a goat, and they say that it, it forms part of their of their diet, and uh, it was important component in terms of uh, food security. So, uh, going back to the key challenges to goat production, as Mulugeta has already talked about, uh, we have uh, climate induced disease state and uh, and morbidity. So, there is a high uh, progen mortality. For example, in, in Botswana. Uh, the mortality rate is, is, is uh, noted to be between 17 and 21 percent currently. And then you also have uh, climate-related feed resource scarcity. 
And then as also Milgate has, has uh, alluded to, there's limited access to and also the high cost of uh, conventional, conventional antiemetics. Then the limited access to veterinary and agriculture extension. So basically, this means that the productivity of goats is, is impacted by some of these challenges. And the project uh, looked at various ways of trying to solve this. So one of the uh, interventions that we uh, designed uh, is looking at targeted selective treatment. In this option, we uh, understand that many goats, whilst they shed, uh, they shed uh, parasites, uh, which can be observed in the fecal aid counts, most of them relay, re remain relatively healthy. So if I uh, bring your attention to the graph on the right, you find that the majority of the goats still shed, uh, shed uh, parasites, but the uh, goats that are in that um, red square are the ones which have the amount of parasites that can actually cause economic and health uh, health issues. So here we have the 80-20 rule where we say that whilst um, um, all the ghosts might have parasites, but 20% would require uh, would require intervention. So by this targeted solution, we were saying that only treating animals in need, reducing drug costs by 70%. This has been studied by Walker uh, in their study in 2015. So targeted selective treatment is a decision-making tool where we use a five-point check system, which I will go into detail in the next slide, to be able to decide which cost to treat. Um, so TST also reduces drug resistance in that when you don't treat all animals, that means there are some uh, 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 animals that still shed um, parasites which have not had contact with the drug and the, when they interact with the ones that have been shared with the drug that reduces their potential to developing resistance so as you can see from uh, the picture there uh, on the bottom right corner there is comparable health and production outcome with 80 percent 83 percent less duema according to study studies by by walker uh, so the five-point check that I've talked about, which is a simple method that farmers can actually use to decide which goats to treat and not to treat, we've got five areas that we look at at a goat. So the first area is the nasal discharge. So when you have, you look at the um, nose area of a goat, you also look at uh, whether the goat uh, has, uh, has got some nasal discharge and that when it, when that is present, then that indicates that that goat will most probably require treatment. Um, so there is the potential to use drugs as well as what I'll go into, what we call bioactive plant components as well. Then the second part is uh, then looking at the body conscience score, where we have got areas around the back of the court, where you also look uh, using your hand, and then when you place your hand on the back of the court, you look at how much muscle and fat that is at the uh, spine section of the court, and then when it is uh, for example, lower than two or one, then that means that it is in a poor body conscience score and then warrants treatment. Um, the third uh, uh, aspect is looking at uh, bottle jaw, uh, which is that ju just under the chin of the goat. Uh, once you find that uh, there is uh, um, there is some swelling that is there, that also is an indication that uh, the internal parasite burden is, is, is quite uh, relevant there and uh, a decision is made to treat. Then you also have uh, what you call um, the dag score, or you look at the, the tail of the goat, if the goat has got scours there, and then you also make a decision uh, depending on the amount and level of scouring that is there. So we also have uh, a, a scale there which shows if it's uh, um, just slightly, then you might not treat, but then if uh, it is also shown on the back of the goat as well as the legs, then that is severe scouring, which requires uh, treatment. And then the the other one is the Famacha, which is the Famacha card uh, that has been developed by colleagues in South Africa. Uh, there you look at uh, the ocular lens or the, the, the you look at the eye of the goat uh, and then you also make a decision on whether to treat or not. So here we are looking at uh, internal parasites like Himonchus contortus, which uh, have been known to, uh, to cause uh, anemia. So that is uh, reflected in the pigmentation of the eye. The 
when the pigmentation is pale, that means that uh, um, uh, you have anemia setting in, so that uh, that requires a treatment. But when you also have a, a, a bright color, which will be the other end of the pharmacia card scale, it also indicates that your god your god has got uh, a very minimal uh, worm burden. Um, so here I'm going to talk about the other intervention that we are going to, we are combining with uh, uh, targeted selective treatment. We also notice that we have got bioactive plant components. By bioactive plant components, we mean that plants that contain uh, a certain level of condensed tannins, and tannins have been noted to disrupt stages of the internal uh, parasite's uh, uh, life cycle. So by feeding these uh, bioactive plant uh, components, which you can see uh, in the uh, bottom uh, right picture where one of the farmers has actually harvested the, the plants and feeding them to gods, we are saying that turning rich plants actually have a dual purpose in that they improve the nutrition of uh, the gods. So by uh, uh, inducing uh, resilience, uh, nutrient-based resilience, but also at the same time, the tannins uh, also interact with the with the with the um, with the in parasites and then disrupt their uh, their life cycle, thereby reducing the, the impact of them on the on the gods. So for, therefore, bioactive plants reduce uh, drug use, uh, and then also the ability to combine uh, tar targeted selective treatment. So you are going to treat 20% of your gods uh, if uh, the, the checks, the five point check that I've talked about were and that. And then instead of using drugs, you also then feed these plants, which have an ability to you to 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 impact uh, health on the. On the on the gods, so this has been uh, uh, the intervention that has been able to uh, enable most uh, resource poor farmers to be able to to treat uh, to treat their gods. On the top right hand corner, I've just uh, shown um, one of the plants that that is that is being used um, and and uh, has shown some uh, antimentic as uh, antimentic effect. Um, so in terms of uh, the impact of uh, targeted select treatment and bioactive plants, our studies have shown that uh, if, you, if you look at uh, the top right uh, hand corner, the, the green graph, uh, the green and, and brown areas, we are saying that uh, we have the use of plant. Uh, in combination of drug, uh, which was high in the first bar, but as we go uh, towards the right of the graph, you find that uh, the brown area, we we have uh, the ghost, number of ghosts that require treatment actually reducing. Um, uh, no, 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 no. Just one more minute, please, if you can. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, so also we also looked at the bottom right screen that you find that uh, as you also visit uh, the number of uh, the number of visits uh, uh, that we looked at, that's four visits there, you find that the pharmacia score, which indicates the level of uh, uh, parasite uh, uh, embedment, means that uh, it's actually reduces. So in that, um, while goats remained an important risk aversion strategy to, to mitigate level strategy, this one, uh, the TST and bioactive plants has also helped resource poor farmers to be able to um, improve uh, goat health. Uh, in terms of the intervention, uh, we are working in Botswana. We were working with over 1,500 farmers, which we are reaching over 30,000 goats. In Malawi, we have a target of over 400,000 farmers with the help of South of Africa throughout the farmer field schools. And then also in Zimbabwe, we are piloting uh, distance learning uh, that is uh, utilization of uh, the five-point check and uh, targeted selective treatment by uh, remote means. Um, for further information, uh, that is my email. That is that is there. You can you can uh, see it in the in the slide. Then I also like to give thanks to our uh, collaborators in the projects. That's um, Alilongo University. Uh, Pretoria University, Harper, Harper Adams, uh, Silk Health Africa, and then Botswana University. Um, that will be all from me. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Lovemore. Again, a, a, another wonderful um, presentation showing the huge economic benefit of, of, of goats and identifying uh, key areas where attention can be focused. Uh, to, to, to bring benefit and to address the, the issue. So thank you very much indeed.
Uh, and then finally, we come to Guru, uh, Guru Thiru, uh, who is the first and currently the only employee of Street Goat. Uh, Guru coordinates the various administrative tasks needed to help a volunteer led community growth function. With a background in product design and passion for regenerative agriculture, he uses design methodologies to improve processes, both in the field and behind the desk. So here we come from Africa to Bristol and over to you, Guru. Thank you. Thanks, John. Uh, yeah, it's quite a journey, isn't it? Uh, let me just share my screen and get started. Uh, cool. Um, so I'm here to talk to you guys about Street Goat. Uh, we're an urban goat farming cooperative uh, started in 2015 by uh, Lynn Davis and a group of wannabe farmers. And they all uh, wanted to lower their impact on the environment, be more self-sufficient and work with goats. Uh, we're very fortunate in Bristol to have access to a lot of really great locally produced food, um, either via CSAs or market gardens, allotments and people's gardens. And um, we also have great infrastructure like this map made uh, by the Bristol Food Network that allows uh, people to see local growing projects near them, um, as well as access uh, independent retailers. We're also really fortunate to have a council that's very forward thinking in um, allowing these projects to access land, both in an urban context and in peri-urban areas. Uh, as mentioned in Lovemore and Mulgeta's presentations, uh, goats are, are really great in the context of marginal land. They have the ability to transform um, scrubland uh, and vegetation into nutrient-rich food. And uh, like chickens and pigs, they have a long history of living in close proximity to people. And in a lot of the world, they continue to live in close proximity rather than out in fields. Um, these two attributes make them ideal for producing food in all the nooks and crannies around the city, all the unused land um, uh, that can be utilized to produce food in a more environmentally sympathetic way. Cities also allow us to access the greatest resource uh, that they have, which is people. Um, owning livestock uh, is a huge demand on people's time, and particularly dairy uh, can be incredibly demanding. Um, you know, it, if one during that lactation, uh, that animal has to be milked every single day. Um, and by bringing the goats into the context of the city, we're able to uh, allow many more people to access them. Um, people who perhaps wouldn't be able to commit in the same time frame if they were managing them on their own. And these goats uh, grow to become hubs for these communities. They uh, connect uh, people through the shared experience of looking after them. And it flips the more traditional equation of one farmer looking after hundreds of heads of livestock. And instead we have a whole community doting on one or two goats. So how's it all work for us? Um, so there are two sides to the project. There is the community dairies, which we have three sites, um, as well as the, our grazing projects. So the dairies usually consist of two nanny goats and their kids, uh, which are either milked once or twice a day. Uh, we practice uh, kid at foot dairying. So this means allowing the kids to nurse and wean themselves in a more natural way um, than uh, is traditionally practiced um, in, in a lot of commercial operations. Um, we've tried this in a few different ways, uh, and it varies from goat to goat and kid to kid. What works best, uh, you know, we separate at night and milk in the morning, or milk while the kids are nursing, uh, or waiting till, you know, around when they're around the three month mark to begin uh, the weaning process. And because there are, you know, roughly seven people to every goat, we're able to tailor the sort of care we give to each animal in a much uh, more individualistic way um, that wouldn't be possible in a commercial context. Uh, we aim to have a largely forage based diet for the goats. Uh, so we don't, uh, we try not to feed any grains or concentrates. Uh, the goats largely uh, gather forage from the enclosures that they're in. The forage is also brought in from the surrounding trees and shrubs and other um, sources of plant material. Um, during milking time, we feed them lucerne pellets uh, or alfalfa. This is uh, grown on a farm in Essex. Um, and along with hay and the straw that we use, are the main uh, inputs that uh, we purchase into the system. Um, 
and the lucerne pellets are, are crucial in terms of providing the right level of calcium and uh, protein required for a dairy animal to produce milk. So we operate as a CSA, uh, a very involved CSA, uh, where members contribute both time and uh, financially to the project. So in a site where we're milking twice a day, uh, it's 14 shifts a week, usually manned by two people at a time, so providing roughly 28 slots. And so each slot uh, costs £70 a year, and members can choose either to milk once or twice a week. Uh, this year, we've been able to create some subsidized slots due to a grant that we were successful in getting. And our hope is that this allows us to open up the project to people from more diverse socioeconomic backgrounds. So in theory, each uh, dairy site supports roughly 14 to 20 households. And so at capacity with our three sites, we, we would hope that we'd be able to support roughly 50 households with their dairy needs. Uh, we employ the most cutting edge of technology. Uh, originally, when we started out, we had uh, this uh, chalkboard where we'd write down our names uh, to, to plan out who was milking when. Uh, since then, we've moved on to using a Google spreadsheet that everyone can access. Uh, this has been a real game changer with us growing and allowing you know, multiple uh, people to move around different sites and projects and still being able to give us a bit of oversight on how that works. Uh, we also use this to keep track of our milk yields, uh, that way, we can communicate amongst each other in, and give, keep track of uh, production as well as health. It's a great indicator of um, animal health. The other side of the project involves grazing. Uh, so the, the kids from the dairy project, typically after anywhere between uh, four to seven months old, go to join uh, the grazing herds. Uh, the grazing side of the project is uh, headed up by Carol and David Lassett, without whom we certainly couldn't manage all of this. They give so much of their own time and energy into this part of the project. Um, I think currently we have five grazing sites in and around Bristol. Um, and to sort of bulk up the numbers, they also buy in weathers from other dairies uh, so that we have the right levels of stocking density in order to make an impact on the vegetation. Uh, a lot of these grazing sites are uh, run in partnership with local councils. So we work with uh, Bristol City Council and South Gloucestershire Council. Um, and in some instances, this is for conservational grazing purposes. So the goats come in over the winter months um, and they eat back the brambles and other sort of woody vegetation, allowing more uh, diverse species of uh, plants to grow in the spring and the summers and thus uh, attracting more invertebrates and increasing the overall biodiversity of the area. Um, the other context we use goats is to clear land. So in this middle picture, you can see a picture of goats up at Purdown uh, in uh, Bristol. So they are up there eating back the brambles and ivy that cover the historic uh, gun battery mounts that are still up there at the top of Stoke Park. And we also use the goats in uh, land clearance projects on a smaller scale, and sometimes in people's gardens. And that's something I think we'd like to try and uh, figure out how to do more of. The goats in these uh, grazing sites are looked after by groups of volunteer goat herders uh, who communicate to each other via WhatsApp groups, building little communities around each of these sites. The goats are checked uh, multiple times a day, uh, and any sort of routine healthcare needs are met by these volunteers. Um, this helps involve people who might not be able to commit to a milking shift, but still want to uh, work with the goats and work with the project. Um, it allows far more people to become part-time farmers um, in their own backyards. The grazing project definitely has our the broadest community outreach for us, um, far more than the dairies are able to do. Uh, it allows, especially in really public places like Purdown, it, where hundreds of visitors pass through uh, on a daily basis, it allows uh, people to engage with the animals, interact with them. Uh, it allows us to engage with people and uh, speak to them about the aims of the project around regenerative land management and producing uh, food in, in an urban context. And sometimes these conversations can be tough. Uh, not everyone agrees with uh, animal-based farming practices and not everyone wants to share the space uh, between goats and dog walkers and other people who be using the space. Um, and I think it's really important for us to have those tough conversations and, uh, and it brings a lot of important topics like where people's food comes from uh, and the impact of that on the environment uh, to the forefront for a lot of people's minds. But overall, uh, people really like goats. So it's often a really great, topic to talk about and it's really engaging and I think it brings a lot of uh, good into people's lives. 
The males from the grazing herds uh, go to slaughter around 12 to 18 months. Um, they're uh, slaughtered at a local abattoir that's run in partnership with the Bristol Veterinary College. Um, the females are retained as future milkers um, uh, for either the project itself or sold to other um, people who want to milk the goats. Uh, the meat is sold directly to members via word of mouth or WhatsApp groups or an email. Um, and the skins and tans, uh, uh, the skins are tanned and sold uh, via social media. In the past, we've been able to run um, butchery courses with the carcasses, um, as well as tanning courses, and that's something we definitely would like to do more of um, in the future to try and uh, continue the the community engagement in all aspects of the project. Um, so some of the challenges and uh, that any urban farming project has is accessing land. And we've been able to access land in a few uh, different ways, um, looking for land that is uh, marginal and is undesirable for other uses. So in the top right uh, at our Troopers Hill site, uh, this is how uh, Lynn found the, the sites, it's just covered in rubbish. Uh, it's in a frost pocket on the north side of Slope. Um, so it wasn't very good as an allotment or for horticultural use, but with some elbow grease, we were able to clean it up, uh, build some amazing uh, roundwood structures, um, and create our very first site. Um, having goats on allotment is also a really handy source of food, um, both in clearing pathways and uh, underused allotments, gathering forage from the surrounding trees and hedges, uh, getting uh, donations of uh, plant trimmings from people's allotments. Uh, with that, we have to be a bit careful to make sure that allotment holders understand that uh, we need to look at what's being fed to the goats to monitor any risk of toxicity. Uh, some other sites where we've been able to take advantage of unusual places, um, our newest project at Royat Hill, uh, the goats live under the archways of this old viaduct that runs through the nature reserve. Um, I think there's something very fitting about goats living under a bridge, uh, uh, and the bridge gives us a lot of um, advantages because we're using space that wouldn't be used for anything else really. Um, it doesn't get enough light for a lot of vegetation to grow. Uh, but the ivy that does grow there is a great food source for the goats and it acts as a shelter to protect them from inclement weather. It allows us to be able to milk outside as well without a lot of infrastructure. So it was very uh, a light uh, touch project to get off the ground. Uh, one of our other sites is uh, just on the side of the M32. Uh, it's in Begbrook in the shadow of Stoke Park. So this uh, bit of land is uh, leased by the Avon Wildlife Trust, who run their Grow Wilder project uh, nearby. And uh, we kind of got onto the site as a grazing project and then um, eventually evolved into a bit of a dairy. Uh, you know, once the goats have kids, you got to milk them. Um, so that's been a really nice natural evolution. Um, and the site has incredibly poor soil. Uh, the ground, uh, the topsoil was scraped off when uh, the slip road and the, the park and ride next door was built. So our hope is that the goats being there will help uh, over the course of time, help increase the fertility of the land and improve it for other purposes. Um, because the land is so uh, tough, uh, we weren't able to get fence posts in, so we've been using electric fencing, which we found really effective uh, across a number of different sites. Um, and because we might not be there permanently, it, it's a very uh, kind of cost-effective, secure way for us to fence our goats, but also be able to transport that part of the project to other sites. So what's in the store for the future for us? Uh, more sites, more goats, and more members both in Bristol and in other places. Um, we're always looking for more grazing opportunities where we can uh, bring goats in to, to manage vegetation and uh, connect with the, the surrounding community. Um, and anyone who's perhaps uh, has ideas about uh, any future dairy sites they might want to explore. But also we'd like to create a model that um, other communities can take away uh, and start in their own towns and cities uh, around uh, the UK and the world. Uh, we'd like to run more workshops, volunteer opportunities and create more public outreach. Um, like the butchering and tanning course, we'd like to also do cheese making um, and other kind of uh, courses that would hopefully attract uh, a more diverse, uh, broad group of people. Uh, and along that, we'd like to work with more diverse groups of people as milking members, as part-time goat herders, people from immigrant communities, people from different socioeconomic backgrounds. Um, you know, urban farming projects can be monocultures and we'd really like to be able to use goats as a way to connect with uh, more diverse people. 
Um, and there's talk of street chicken, maybe street sheep and street pig. Uh, I think chickens in particular could work really well in our CSA model and uh, complement the goats uh, in the rotation well and allow people to meet their dairy and egg needs all at once. Um, yeah, thanks for letting me ramble on about goats. Uh, please, if you have any questions, drop us an email, visit our website and get in touch. And thank you. Uh, Guru, thanks. I think my capacity to be inspired is is exhausted and I think <laughs> you're not the only one. Um, we are clearly, um, we have very little time left for questions, I'm afraid. There is a Zoom session, of course, where we can carry this forward, to which everyone is welcome. But we do have uh, one first question I think we can try and get in now, uh, which I think will go to uh, Olegeta, will go to you perhaps. On animal health, how has Farm Africa integrated local indigenous knowledge and medicines? Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Love More. Thank you, Guru, for your uh, very exciting presentation. It's, a, it's a, another great opportunity for me to learn. Uh, thank you, John. Uh, actually, uh, I'm a, 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 it looks very tough question to, to me. Uh, I mean, uh, yes, definitely. We, we know that there are traditional practices as far as animal health management is concerned in pastoral areas and we have practical experience in that. Uh, but uh, because we are expected to align our interventions with the formal agricultural extension system, uh, which is in favor of uh, uh, what you call improved animal health practices, because uh, the scientific methods are uh, more disfavoring this traditional knowledge and practices, uh, uh, you know, in expectation that those practices will lead into uh, intractable uh, or unmanageable health problems. So they don't recommend uh, and rather favor the scientific methods. And we are also, as uh, government allies in those lines, we're expected to do, to practice, the, to, to follow the, the what called the scientific methods. So, but we didn't move uh in that line but there must be uh, some kind of research knowledge generation uh how the scientific and traditional methods combine together in a way that it benefits uh both but now there is a big gap in terms of mix up but I i'm sure that lab more is a uh, the right person to build on that later uh and on the second question uh in terms of uh, on uh, the, uh, the impact of grazing uh, as more and more goats are. Uh, the, the, since we uh, intervened in these two geographical locations, we didn't observe, and that's why goats are really preferred uh, for these fragile ecosystems where rangeland degradation is, is, is clearly noticed, uh, and their feed preference. They are, they are uh, more interested in uh, thorny species like acacia species, uh, where uh, aban where acacia species are very abundant, so we didn't notice clearly the pressures uh, of goats on the in geographical locations we are operating. But definitely, there should be a study on, on setting the threshold uh, as to uh, the maximum limit that a specific amount of grazing land is carrying, uh, which I recommended. Uh, uh, for knowledge to be generated in that line. Otherwise, negative impact on tree regeneration is not yet noticed uh, from goat side, but rather from livestock, I mean, from cattle side. Uh, and- okay, well, I, I think we're, we're getting up to, I'm afraid we're getting up to the end of the time, but that was actually a question about what impact is goat grazing and browsing having on local vegetation, particularly negative impacting tree shrub regeneration. What you're saying is that it it's 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 neutral perhaps um and then there's always the the question of the cattle well that's another issue maybe we can carry that forward so i think we need to close um this particular session huge thanks to um Mulugeta, to love more and to guru for the extraordinary stories that we've heard today i'm hoping that a new goat a community of people interested in goats will emerge uh from this um because they play such an important role 
there is um, uh, a, zo um, a Zoom link which has been circulated. So I think we'll close this session now with huge thanks. Um, you're very welcome to come forward to the Zoom session and we'll carry on the questions and dialogue there. So thank you very much, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.